Good morning. We're going to continue the workshop. This is opening of the second day or the opening of the fifth session of the workshop. And, uh, Don't look at me. No, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> we had four presentations yesterday. So without the random introduction, we are going to continue, although with the regular approach of short introduction by the speaker, and then you can start your thing. We're going to have generally 90 minutes for that, so up to 30 minutes presentation. We're going to try to limit to 20 minutes response. And try. I have the ball. Change the cameras. The camera, mm, the camera is still works us. Yeah. And then we open for, as always, for a roundtable discussion. With questions, comments, suggestions, with the general mindset of helping this version of the paper to get better and published. Are we doing this anyway? Good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone. Okay, first of all, my introduction, my presentation, right? And as you know, at this point, I'm Giulia Bai. I come from the University of Pavia in Italy. And uh, actually, uh, right now, I'm also working with a foundation in Italy, in Milan, that uh, um, basically conducts research on public health law and uh, advocates for the protection and, and enhancement of the protection of these rights. Health rights and, uh, but I uh, got my PhD in, in the University of Milano Bicocca, where I focused on the possible development of the role and possible regulation of non-state armed groups. And actually, uh, my uh, presentation today rega um, regards um, our non-state non -state armed groups. And in particular, I wanted to focus on the possible developments of the uh, threshold required for an armed conflict to take place in consideration of the role of uh, non-state armed groups, which I will call from now on NSAG. Hopefully I don't confuse all these letters, but yeah. And um, I believe this is, a, this is an interesting topic because even though it is true that uh, right now uh, another conflict has gained the main pages of all the newspapers uh, worldwide, uh, it, is, is true, it is still true that today uh, non-international armed conflicts and IACs are quite wide, um, common and widespread. Uh, if you look at the data of the uh, Geneva Academy website, you will see that uh, this type of conflict is still quite widespread in several regions of the world. And as we know, to have a non-international armed conflict, we need involvement of at least one NSAG, one or more. So these type of armed actors are quite common today. So I believed it it was interesting to uh, assess and possibly reassess the uh, criteria required for a non-international armed conflict to take place. And I think this is particularly significant considering that, as you know better than me, uh, when an armed conflict take pla takes place, a particular set of rules apply, which may lead to a different um, management and uh, the application of different tools for a certain situation, uh, a set of rules which would be, dif would be different from the rules applied in peacetime when basically the IHL framework does not apply. So I believe it was interesting to revise, uh, reassess these, uh, the threshold basically and the criteria which has to be uh, 
um, taken into consideration to check whether or not these threshold for an armed conflict to take place has been reached. And to do so, I have decided basically to uh, first evaluate the um, existing rules on the concept of non-international armed conflict, the definition of the threshold and the criteria necessary, as I mentioned, for a non-international armed conflict to take place, and then to move uh, towards the assessment of the particular problems raised by the involvement of NSAGs in armed conflicts. So first of all, I started with conventional provisions uh, on non-international armed conflict. And I started with the CA3, so common article three to the four Geneva conventions of 1949. And um, I'm sorry for the bad quality <laughs> and graphic quality of my slides, but they were just, uh, they are just slides to, in order to, for everyone to read uh, the articles I mentioned. And so this is article, common article three, which basically states that in the case of armed conflict, not, not of an international character occurring in the territory of one of the high contracting parties, each party shall be bound, bound to apply the following provisions that I didn't insert here. As you know, the common article three is considered like a mini convention, like a convention in miniature that has to be applied in this particular um, armed conflict, but uh, reading this article and trying to understand what are the characteristics of a non-international armed conflict, um, let's say if someone tries to do so, this person may be um, somewhat um, disappointed because in a sense, common article three, it's a very vague provision. It doesn't uh, state um, criteria necessary for a non-international armed conflict to take place in a very precise manner. And it's almost tautological in a way. It just says that an armed conflict of non-international character, of course, in the, can occur in the territory of the high contracting parties, but it doesn't explain any, nothing more regarding the, the necessary requirements for a non-international armed conflict to take place. In this sense, the uh, commentary, let's see if it works. Okay, the commentary of the ICRC, so the International Committee of the Red Cross of 1960, um, comes in help in a sense because it provided a series of convenient criteria to identify when a non-international armed conflict takes place. And these are the criteria that have been identified by the ICRC. And they are the presence of an organized structure, the possession of part of the national territory by the NSAG, the ability to engage in conflicts with the state authorities, and uh, the fact that the legal, legal government is obliged to uh, resort to the use of military force against uh, insurgents. Okay, taking into consideration the fact that insurgents are a particular category of NSAGs, what uh, and the fact that actually non-international armed conflicts can occur even between different two or more NSAGs without the involvement of state authorities, the criteria that emerge as necessary for a non-international armed conflict to take place are the presence of an organized structure, so the organization of the NSAG or the uh, NSAGs, and the. Um, the organization and the ability to engage in conflicts, as well as the possession of national territory, which is some, somehow instrumental to the ability to engage in conflicts. So the uh, final, uh, not final, but the uh, conclusion that has been reached is actually that the uh, criteria that are necessary for the application of common article three are the presence of an organized structure, so an organizational criterion, and the presence of a certain level of intensity of the hostilities conducted. Um, however, this um, conclusion is not perfectly uh, uniform with what has been later said in Article 1 of AP2. Okay. Uh, <laughs> AP2, first of all, uh, this is Article 1 of the Additional Protocol 2 to the Four Geneva Convention, which was adopted. 
uh, a few decades after the uh, Geneva Conventions. First of all, uh, it's interesting to, to note that actually this article establishes that this uh, protocol develops, this article de uh, and the protocol actually develops and supplements common Article 3. So one should expect to see, um, one would expect to see a uniform definition of what a non-international armed conflict is. However, the threshold that is presented in Article 1 is a little bit different and higher from the one of Common Article 3. In particular, um, the uh, Article 1 of AP1 requires the conflict to take place between the armed forces of the state and uh, one or more NSAGs. So, and of course, there is the last uh, part of this article, which basically excludes, uh, excludes a series of hypotheses and situations which are not intense enough, basically, sort of, yeah, to be considered as a non-international uh, conflict. And in particular, I want to underline the fact that it is mentioned that the protocol shall not apply to isolated and sporadic, sporadic acts of violence. And this would be important for the, with the one which I believe would be the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, at the moment we have two conventional provisions which have two slightly different concepts of what the threshold for an armed uh, conflict of non-international nature to take place is. In this sense, uh, after a few decades, again, we have the um, uh, case law of the ICTY, so the International Criminal Court for ex-Yugoslavia, for the former Yugoslavia, which basically uh, had to define whether a certain situation was a uh, non-international armed conflict, and it uh, took the opportunity to uh, say, first of all, in the Tadic case, that this type of armed conflict exists when there is a resort to armed force between states or protracted armed violence between governmental authorities and organized armed groups or between such groups within a state. So the organizational criteria is confirmed. However, the intensity criteria is again <laughs> presented somewhat differently because here the we have an adjective which has never been mentioned before in the other instruments and in the commentaries to the other instruments, which is the adjective protracted. And this uh, actually this def definition has been confirmed by other case law, also by other international tribunals. For instance, in the Akayesu case of the Rwanda, Rwanda Criminal Tribunal. And uh, and it has been confirmed also by the Limai case, which has been judged by the um, SETY as well. And it is interesting because, again, protracted, protracted, which is a very difficult word to pronounce for me. I don't know why. Uh, it's an adjective that basically makes reference to a uh, um, time, a requirement based on time, which was not mentioned in previous provisions regarding non-international armed conflicts. So um, while it is true that has, it has been said in the Limai case, the um, assessment of whether or not a, a certain situ situation amounts to a non-international armed conflict has to be assessed, as I mentioned, on a case-by-case -case basis. It is also true that the, um, this element, this protracted, protracted adjective makes reference necessarily to a time requirement. So intensity has to be evaluated under the case law of the ICTY on a time-focused approach, under a time-focused approach. But this approach has not been confirmed by all international case law. In fact, one has to mention necessarily the Tablada case, which has been decided by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights which actually uh, stated that uh, an armed attack that occurred for, that lasted 30 hours, actually amounted to uh, an armed conflict. So basically the court just uh, evaluated the intensity criterion independently on the time 
uh, aspect. So it doesn't matter if the attack is short in time, doesn't last very long, the intensity requirement can can and should be evaluated under uh, another independently from the time that um, the, from the time element of the attack. So at, the, at this moment, we can con conclude by now that the threshold for a non-international armed conflict to take place is quite, um, it's not undisputed in international humanitarian law. And uh, I, oh, okay, one has to also remember that in the ICC statute, in the Rome statutes, act, 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 Rome statute actually, there is a, another um, definition of what a non-armed uh, conflict, a non, sorry, non-international armed conflict is. In fact, article 8.2 uh, letter F regarding war crimes establishes that Paragraph E, so other serious violation of the laws and customs applicable in armed conflicts, not of an international character, applies to those armed conflicts, uh, not of an international character, and does not apply to situation of internal disturbances and tensions, but it applies to armed conflict that take place in the territory of a state when there is a protracted armed conflict between governmental authorities and organized armed groups, or between such groups. So it's a in the middle definition, which is not the same, it, it's not identical to any of the other definitions provided before. Because it, while it is true that it makes reference to the, it, um, to the exclusion of a certain um, type of situation uh, which has been provided by uh, the second part of Article 1 AP2, it is also true that it makes reference to situations that occur in territory in the territory of state and when there is a protracted armed conflict so we have the time element which is again proposed in this uh, uh, article but at the same time this uh, conflict can take place between the state authorities and ns uh, and or one or more nsag but it can also occur between such groups without the involvement of the state authorities so it's a I would say some, somehow the elements are the same, but they are combined in different manners. So the conclusion by now is that there is no one undisputed definition in, of non-international armed conflicts in uh, of the threshold for a non-international armed conflict to take place in international humanitarian law. And uh, okay. I've finished my slides because from now on I won't mention any other article <laughs> because having assessed so I I said okay we might as might as well consider the threshold to be reached for a non-international armed conflict to take place taking into consideration the fact that NSAGs are wi quite widespread today and at the same time of course the particular characteristics of warfare involving these type of groups and in particular, I took into consideration the fact that uh, these groups often tend to uh, organize themselves into coalitions, but at the same time, at the same time, these coalitions may be quite fragile. They, they tend to split and then reconstruct another uh, coalition, which may be different. And uh, and of course, these may have an impact on the organizational criterion. Then I also took into consideration the fact that oftentimes these groups don't have the financial resources of states, so they may resort to cheaper weapons, which may be less uh, effective, and this may have an impact on the intensity criterion. And I also take, take, took into consideration the fact that sometimes uh, these uh, groups tend to resort to unconventional warfare strategies because of the asymmetric nature of the warfare in which they are involved. involved. We, oftentimes these, uh, these conflicts have this asymmetrical structure nature. So as I said, regarding the first element, which is the, uh, organization 
which is referenced, uh, which is uh, affecting, let's say, the organizational criterion. Um, as I mentioned, small, smaller or bigger, but uh, non-state armed groups can uh, merge into a coalition, then split, then maybe uh, reunite in another, re-merge into another coalition. And uh, uh, in this sense, I believe there are two main, I believe, I, I studied and I come to the conclusion that this conclusion is the most uh, reliable, that there are two main uh, strategies to consider the, uh, to assess the organizational criterion for NSAGs. One would be uh, to consider each um, NSAG independently. So check the organizational criterion for each NSAG uh, um, taken uh, by its own. Or the other one would be to consider the coalition of NSAGs in a, as a whole. Um, this, the first uh, solution would be, first of all, quite unpractical. In practice, it would mean to assess in concrete whether or not a certain specific group, which may be quite small, has reached the necessary level of organization. But it also may lead to paradox on a para uh, paradoxical conclusion. So if a coalition is composed by a multitude of small NSAGs, the organizational criterion under this fragmented approach won't be reached, but the coalition in itself would be sufficiently organized, which would, make, which would be a paradoxical conclusion in the end. Uh, whereas, of course, if you take into consideration the coalition as a whole, it may lead to, first of all, easier, like um, an, a procedure of assessment which would be easier to conduct. And that at the same time, it may lead to a more um, non-paradoxical conclusion. Regarding the other two elements, so the resort to non-expensive um, non, non weapons, so cheap weapons that may not have been, uh, may, may not have the same uh, impact of um, more expensive weapons that NSAGs oftentimes cannot buy and uh, which may affect, as I said, the intensity criterion. Um, I assessed this uh, problem together with the third problem, which is, as I said, the resort to unconventional warfare tactics. I, I wanted to mention another thing. I, in, in my paper, I um, cited as an example the use of landmines, which are the poor man's weapon, but actually also uh, with new technologies, there are cheap new technology weapons, like cheap drones. If you buy a cheap drone, like my boyfriend goes fishing and he has a small boat that he uses to basically put like, um, yeah, to, to put uh, whatever he wants to, to basically gather fish, fish and then he will finish the fish. But if you use the same small automatic boat and you but you put a bomb or an explosive device on it. What's the, it may be used, of course, not for, for fishing, but it would be like a, a very non expensive new technology, like new technology weapon that may be used. But again, it would be a cheap weapon. And of course, it, will, it would affect the intensity criterion so I, I consider these two elements together. First, um, one can resort to a qualitative approach. So basically, uh, one can evaluate, can assess the number of casualties related to the conflict, and can decide. Okay, after um, I don't know 100 war-related casualties, there is a conflict. Now there is an armed conflict. But uh, first of all, this. Um, approach is not supported by case law. And as I mentioned before, the Tadic, no. well, the Tadic, uh, sorry, no, the Limai case that I mentioned before, oops, okay, thank you. The Limai case mentioned a case-by-case -case approach. So it requires more flexi uh, certain uh, 
somewhat flexible approach that are quali strictly qualitative approach um, cannot realize. It would be too, too rigid, but also it will be, again, quite impractical in reality to assess the exact number of casualties related to a conflict. And again, it may uh, not work in case of a low intensity, low intensity conflict. And another uh, theory that has been submitted actually um, revolves around the behavior of states. So basically when a state has to resort to the military use of force instead of the legal use of force, which is um, used in, I don't know, in peace, in, during peacetime uh, to protect human rights, then when this situation occurs, we are in the presence of another conflict. However, this, uh, this theory requires the involvement of a state. But as we said before, several um, non-international armed conflict, at least in the definitions uh, different from the one of AP2, occurs between, can occur between uh, NSAGs without the involvement of a state. So these, the, um, these hypothesis is limited in its application to um, the hypothesis in which a state is involved. So a third theory, which may be uh, the most uh, um, coherent with the development of international law in general and with the final aim of IHL, sorry, is the theory based on a human rights approach, meaning uh, when <clears throat> uh, okay, when you have to resort to military force to guarantee to protect human rights, then you are in the presence of uh, an unarmed conflict. It's quite similar to the previous uh, hypothesis that I mentioned that was submitted by Dal and Sanbu, for instance. But the focus here is not the behavior of the state, but it's on human rights. So when human rights are not protected by legal means, uh, legal force uh, applicable in peacetime, and it is necessary to resort to military force, then we are in the presence of an armed conflict. It would make sense because, first of all, it's a flexible approach. It has to be assessed but on a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, it, it lacks certainty and um, as we know in law, certainty is always is almost always a good point. But at the same time, uh, in this particular uh, situation, first of all, a flexible approach is coherent with international case law, the Limay case again. And again, it allows um, the threshold for an armed conflict to take place to evolve following the developments of warfare. Second, uh, this approach may, is coherent with the final goal of IHL. So IHL ultimately aims at guaranteeing the hum human dignity and human rights, even in the presence of an armed conflict. Of course, uh, some um, conducts are legitimate during, under IHL and not in peacetime, but still the ultimate aim is the protection and the safeguard of human dignity. And for instance, may I recall the St. Petersburg's declarations and the principles that were already set in that declaration. Um, so it would make sense in looking at the final aim of IHL. And uh, last, um, international law in general is moving towards a stronger and stronger focus on human rights in general. As Cassese wrote, we are at a point of no return in the protection of human rights. So human rights have become the focus of human uh, international law in, in general. And also the um, distinction in application of IHL and IHRL is becoming more and more blurred. Once there was a strong, like a sharp distinction, okay, IHL is applicable in wartime and human rights law is applicable during peacetime. But now this distinction is not as uh, sharp anymore. And therefore the um, 
approach in the identification of the threshold for an armed conflict to take place based on the um, assessment of on, on a focus on human rights would not be that um, estranged from the, the uh, general development of international law. And uh, yeah, these uh, are my thoughts. This is what I came up with until now, but I'm looking forward to hearing your comments and your feedbacks and your suggestions to, to improve my work. I am at 28 minutes, so I am perfectly on time. So you have two minutes if you want to borrow them from me. <laughs> and thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to structure my comments uh, by giving you some very specific comments, picking up on some things that you said during now during the presentation, which are, of course, also already mentioned in your paper, and then coming to more overall comments, because, um, well, thank you, first of all, for the paper and now for the presentation. I, um, I think you're kind of on to something, but at some point, and this is a, a general first comment, at some point you, you kind of start with it, but then you, you move away from it again. And um, I felt a bit uh, um, kind of unsatisfied. It's like, oh, but this is, you know, like, why, why didn't you continue? And obviously this is only a draft and you can write a lot more. Um, but in order to be able to do so and keep it manageable, I think that you can shift maybe the, um, the focus and shorten some parts. And I'll explain now with specific comments why um, um, why that may be useful. Um, as a general specific comment, <laughs> because you are criticizing specific or you're noting differences in language, etc. Of the of the provisions, it's important to also yourself in terminology to be very precise. Uh, there is no such thing as an armed conflict in IHO. It's always either an IAC or a conflict uh, not of an international character. And sometimes you use generally the term armed conflict. And flowing from that, it's sometimes not entirely clear with proficient you mentioned where you then talk about an IAC or an IAC or, or uh, both at the same time. So pay attention to your um, terminology specifically with these kind of things because that you're saying like, oh yeah, but this provision has these words, but then you need to, of course, yourself be very uh, um, careful about that. And then for example, there's um, a sentence, I, I wrote it down, this contempt you say something like contemporary armed conflicts involving non-state arms groups, comma, which are mainly NIACs. And I was like, well, are there also IACs with non-state armed groups? Um, arguably, there are one Article 1, uh, 4 situations, um, but in the world, there's only one in the Western Sahara. So then the, the sentence mainly NIACs, they're basically the all but one there are NIACs, unless you have the view that um, non-state actors can also be part of an IAC, which mm -hmm you can hold, but that's quite a specific view. So then it's worth to at least have a footnote or explain. Um, so just a little side sentence like this could kind of color um, someone reading it or color the perception of someone reading it thinking like, oh, she apparently holds this view and but then you don't come back yeah, to it. Yeah, that sentence uh, bothered me for a while. <laughs> so just it, specifically in the context of this paper where you um, uh, where you consider like words, it, it's important to then yourself in those words that relate to, to you know, armed conflict, huh? to also be very precise. Uh, in the first part, you track kind of chronological the uh, definition of armed conflict, but you're not doing it entirely chronological because you're mm -mm. bringing in later views. And I think that it makes sense to really be chronological. Um, 
because it make it makes it more clear the development of where we are now in terms of what is the uh, uh, what is the accepted threshold of non-international conflict. Because on that point, I I disagree with you, and, and I think there is an accepted threshold of non-international conflict. Um, and that that would become more clear if you if you do not, while <laughs> discussing, for example, common article three, bring in later views on it, because the convenient criteria that you refer to are mentioned in the commentary. But um, if you look at the travaux of common article three, you can see that these convenient um, uh, criteria were mentioned but were explicitly rejected as being. Um, too low, because actually at the time states wanted common article three to be like a classic civil war, basically a belligerency, recognition of belligerency like situation. The ICRC may not necessarily have been happy with that, considered it too strict, but that was not um, what the states had in mind. It's only, and later on, for example, in the Limai case, they explicitly considered the convenient criteria and then rejected it because they said, at that time, they were considered even too stringent, um, but also with the wording like, well, these these were uh, were thought of, but the delegates explicitly said, or the delegates rejected them, so we're not going to follow them. But by discussing the uh, convenient criteria in your discussion of common article three, you're bringing in kind of a later discussion whilst what you're doing initially is like, all right, what does common, what did common article three, 1949 say? You move on afterwards to 1977. Um, but you're bringing in later um, later views. And it's the same with the non-state actor versus non-state actor. Common Article 3 doesn't, doesn't exclude that, but it's certainly never meant to cover that. The ICRC tried to, tried to bring this back in 1977, and states again said, like, no, we do not want this covered by IHL. And they clarified... And also, by the way, your view of 1940 of the Common Article 3 is incorrect because we never meant this to be covered. Fast forward till 1995, when the Tadic definition did include this, states were willing by that time to accept it. But if you already, in your initial discussion of Common Article 3, assume that that's part of the definition, then you're bringing in kind of the, the later information. Um, so I think it's what I said, it's useful to, to, to more strictly discuss the chronology. If you um, do that, you arrive at some point at 1995, the Tadic definition, which at that point maybe was not yet accepted by like virtually all states as, as reflective of custom, but soon it became so. In between, you had La Tablada. But it's 1997, um, and before all the new military manuals restated Tadic and said, this is it. But also, La Tablada was in between um, Limay, Harijinay, Boskowski, uh, the Sierra Leone Tribunal accepting the same criteria, the ICTR, and obviously ICY, ICR, it's not always... The, the strongest to say, like, look, the ICR also accepted it because they have the same appeals chairman. It was the exact same judges who confirmed on the, in the Tadic appeal that that was the case as they did for Akayesu. But um, the uh, if you chronologically go and then see it, so then it was accepted by other tribunals. It kept being incorporated in military manuals. Uh, in 2006, the ICRC wrote the famous opinion paper. Um, took that as well and the ICC has basically taken on board uh, you need to at some point then discuss of course article A2F uh, the protracted armed conflict there was some misunderstanding at the time Sierra Leone in 1998 um, put forward this after a discussion but it's, it's just a translation mistake and that's also what the court in middles had, uh, by now the court has said that in, in every single case where it came up. So there's no, at the moment, there's no discussion at least at the court anymore on that. Um, and in case law, it seems to be also pretty clear to 
kind of then take a step back to 1997 and say like, yeah, but because Tablada, it's not entirely, um, uh, there's still discussion. It like, it does not seem to, to really follow the, um, the way how the case laws develop, but also the state's view on the matter. And what I said, especially the military manuals are, are useful in that regard. If you look at the UK, Manual. If you look at the new DoD manual, um, just the, the, the various ones uh, that are accessible online, they've all now accepted uh, tidings. They've all accepted the organization and intensity. Whereas there's um, something interesting which you can then track. Like, yes, it said protect protracted first, and then in Lima they explained there was no uh, time element, and then they explained it better in Haradjinai, and then in Boskowski they came to these. Uh, factors and indicators for the uh, for both intensity and um, uh, an organization, and that's where then you change to the second kind of part of your paper. And I was like, oh, that, that you know, now you're going to go into it because you started talking about landmines, etc. Because I think that that would be the value of your paper if you really take it from there and then be like, all right, so we yes. There, because I do what I said, I do think that there's an accepted kind of everyone seems to agree, like, okay, we have these indicators, criteria, Boskowski. But those were come, uh, come up with in relation to the Yugoslav conflict, the Balkan War. And despite other um, courts and tribunals having applied them in other situations and that seemingly being fine, some of these factors of indicators will certainly not work well in the future. And then, for example, your discussion of the organ uh, of organization, if you have a coalition, um, and then you were talking about like cheap weapons, uh, like to, to take those criteria and just, and the sort of factors in the case and, and, and almost spell them out. You have a whole, a long quote of, uh, of, uh, of Boskowski and then kind of look at, okay, are these still gonna work now? Are they still working now? Or are they still gonna work in 10 years or 20 years? And if not, how are we actually going to be able to assess indeed um, whether or not a, uh, a non-international conflict exists, whether the threshold is, um, is, is met, the lower threshold. That, um, that could be a very useful contribution and you kind of start with it, but then you, you're still looking retrospectively almost, or more like, okay, this is going on now and then Retrospect, now say retrospective because you talk about landmines. And the criteria were designed with exactly a situation of landmines in mind. Not that armed groups already had landmines at the time. And the tactics that you discuss weren't that the whole point of IHL having to evolve to incorporate guerrilla warfare as a, is because the tactics of, of non state armed groups are different. And they're not the, the, the idea that you have non-state armed groups fighting is not new, of course. You, you can't, you wouldn't have had the situation of Nayak if there wasn't already, there weren't already non-state armed groups. And Mao already said, like, um, did you you refer to a uh, at some point you referred to new tactics where they need the cooperation of the population, etc. And but my Mao has the famous quote, like fish need a sea to swim in or need water to swim mm -hmm. in. That was no different at the um, guerrilla warfare at the time than it is um, now. But what is different is that they can meet online and possibly have like, can you have an organization, um, like a, a virtual organization, so to say. And rather than headquarters, geographical headquarters, just the fact that, uh, that people can stay connected online, does that allow them to fulfill the organizational criteria for them? But there's a lot of, um, newer things that are in for that sense very relevant and then when you talk about and i'm glad that's why you now you brought up the drones this was the first thing that i was thinking you talked about landmines like yeah but they, they've always been there and those are taken into account with um with the criteria and are discussed in the case law but for example those very cheap drones that you now have that are can, that can be used or cyber attacks those are the things that are not taking into account yet and and would those perhaps really challenge the um, or create difficulty in, in applying the criteria. So if, if, if you would go that direction, I think it, it can be uh, very useful, but it also allows you to be very structured. 
because towards the end when you discuss the the aggregated intensity um the uh and then the para the like the coalition I'm, I'm i'm not entirely sure why it is paradoxical to have a coalition meet the requirement and the individual armed groups not but then the question is more like who is the party to the armed conflict is it the mm -hmm. entire coalition and is the coalition actually the armed group then but um reading that and then your uh um, ultimate conclusion to to focus on the human rights but i i was wondering like okay what is what are you aiming to kind of end up at it almost seems that you're uh, proposing to lower the threshold like a lot and whilst also the ICRC, for example, but in, ge in general with IHL, when there weren't any human rights, and that's why I, I thought it was, and I, I was a little confused towards the end when you started talking about the human rights approach, but the whole point was that why initially everyone wanted IHL to be, this is the big 10 mantra, as I often refer to it, like the, the IHL should be applied as widely as possible, as it's written in uh, the commentary to um, GC1, um, the, the commentary article three, common article three of GC1, that made sense when there wasn't also human rights law. But human rights law has since then grown exponentially. So in a non-international conflict, if IHL is not applicable, there's a lot that is applicable. And following the, the, um, the global war on terror um, and the, the shift from where states initially denied the application of IHL because they were not, they did not want to be seen as being in a non-international armed conflict, having kind of lost control over their territory. And they, they really were denying the existence of such an armed conflict until it would really be a full-scale civil war situation of belligerency where it was in their interest to make sure that the, other, the opposing side had um, obligations. That shift changed after 9-11, um, after, after uh, what I said, the war on terror, when states started relying on IHL as an enabling or permissive uh, body of law amongst others to target um, uh, in other uh, in other territories and to uh, so because they they perceive IHL at least even though it's a question whether the law of Nayak gives any such uh, authorization but as giving authorization to kill and detain so there, there's been a shift at some point from wanting to apply IHL as widely as possible on the humanitarian side of IHL, so the ICRC, et cetera, to actually trying to reduce the application of IHL. Um, states sometimes still want to apply IHL as widely as possible with the idea, but only basically to their own, the permissive uh, way of being able to uh, carry out certain strikes. Um, but with your conclusion where you kind of make it dependent partially on the the actions of the state um and like the state resort to military force to protect human rights but then state should actually be wanting to do that of course it makes me fearful that you're making it too easy for a state to rely on ihl but purely in um in the the for for targeting purposes whilst what you mentioned the ultimate aim of ihl would be to um, uh, for human dignity. I, I do think you need to qualify this by saying, well, the ultimate aim of IHL is to allow warfare to be conducted with ensuring that the, the least amount of um, uh, persons who should not be engaged in the in the violence are are affected by it. But um, IHL never meant to uh, completely outlaw. Um, of course, regular uh, belligerent act uh, to things um, in the, uh, what I said about the, um, the the human rights approach. So, because Una Hathaway, who proposes that, um, she writes about she writes in reaction to the the drone strike policy of uh, of the U.S. and very much also during the Obama government. So her goal is actually to, to make it difficult to apply IHL. She wants the opposite. She wants to, to higher the threshold. Um, so to take part of kind of her proposals, but I, 
I wasn't sure. And then merge it with um, what uh, Anne Willi Dahl, for example, said, who really looked from the, the uh, he was writing in response to a NATO, uh, the NATO discussion, ISAF in Afghanistan, who, um, who wanted to give more leeway to, uh, to armed forces. It's, it's, yeah, I'm not sure if you can merge them easily. Um, it, unless your aim is to lower the threshold. Um, but then if that is, you, you need to question yourself whether that can result in um, what you refer to the ultimate aim of IHL, protecting human dignity better. So on that part, I think you need to maybe explain a bit more like why you think it's good to, um, to focus on, uh, um, explain better what you view the end result to be and why this would be um, the, the preferred option, um, as opposed to what you do now, it's like saying like, well, this is a way, but um, uh, without discussing the consequences of the way, it's hard to assess whether it's indeed the, the preferred way. I have uh, one last comment, I'm now thinking what it was. Uh, I'll come up with it in a bit. I had one other overall comment, um, which, uh, oh yes, that's it. Um, you referred to um, to threshold, uh, the threshold a lot, and you occasionally bring back in IAC, law of IAC again, mm -hmm. uh, just explaining article two, uh, two A of the Brahms statute, or generally what are the rules for, but of course, you're really focusing only on NIAC. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you want, leave out everything related to law of IAC just for space and it doesn't. But if you are still referring sometimes to IAC and you, and you discuss the threshold, you need to somewhere discuss, of course, the first shot theory. And the fact that there has also been a discussion whether or not there's a threshold for, um, for law of IAC. I would say leave it all out because you don't <laughs> need it for your paper. But if you do keep references to, to IAC in, you need to, uh, because you use the word threshold so often, you need to at least engage, and also sometimes generically, you talk about threshold of armed conflict, you need to engage with that. All right, I think, I think it may be a broader discussion now. Thank you. Uh, may I, I don't want to respond and- No, uh, please do. No, it's yeah. just, uh, thank you, because actually some of the um, things that you mentioned while reading and rereading it, uh, I sort of grasped that there was something that I couldn't make my mind up on what was not working, but some things that you said to me, not all of them, but some of them were something that didn't resonate very well with me, like while, while rereading my work, especially the like the the two part parts thing. Like there is, as I said, I realized that there is no easy uh, connection between one part of the other. So that was a uh, um, very welcomed um, observation you did. But all of them actually, I will except on some of them I will have to rethink about it. And actually, one thing that, uh, like while reading, while uh, writing it and studying for it, I realized that that unless I, like, of course, everything can be more deeply explained. But yes, the aspects of the the issue regarding the first part and um, how to present it in a uh, complete but somehow not encyclopedic manner came up to me. So definitely I will take your, your um, reference to our sharp chronological presentation very, very into consideration. But on just the, something that I wrote down and didn't mention, I think to make it easier because of the way how it developed first from treaty provisions and then um, discussion about it in case law, afterwards the case law being accepted um in military manuals of the customer uh, customary view um arising if you also in addition to chronology just stick to the hierarchy of sources of uh of public international law and it happens to be in this case that it really fo follows 
the hierarchy of sources. You have a nice framework for yourself that leads to a, a initial conclusion. And that's the initial conclusion is what leads to the second part of your paper, of course. But at least then um, you can have a very easily structured first part. And it doesn't need to be too, too long because the interesting next step is, of course, yeah, that's like, what are we going to do with that's it? That's the other thing that I told myself, OK, who am I to add something new regarding the first part? Of, I mean, I, who am I to add something new? Full stop. But <laughs> having said so, the first part in particular, uh, it has been discussed in depth for years by uh, excellent authors and scholars. So. I don't know how I like while writing, I was like, what's the point for me to discuss this part, which has been already so well discussed by others. So um, that was the other um, thing that came up to me. So I don't know, I guess, especially when taking into consideration your observation, uh, the second part may be more um, interesting in a sense. Then the first one, one, but I guess the first one is, uh, as you said, a leeway to towards the second part. Well, well, you need the first part in order to, of course, have the framework that you're then going to consider. All right, but now, looking forward and and having, you know, it's where you say contemporary, non-international, um, non-state armed groups. Uh, yeah just with any kind of, you need the law uh, in order to apply it to the facts, in order to come, be able to decide whether or not it works. So you'll need, you'll need to do something with it, but it doesn't have to be, of course, too long because what you say indeed, uh, like uh, it, it's been written a fair bit about it. And if you use, for example, uh, reference to Sandy Sivakumaran's book, um, you can deal, deal with article A2F in like two sentences. Um, so you don't have to spend too much time on it to really so use the, the, the space and the time you have for the, the second part. Okay, thank you. Because you don't want it to become like a 40,000 page article. Because no, especially I don't want it to be like for the 70% of it, something that has already been written by others. So. <laughs> Um, no, just a comment to Rocky about uh, um, knives, knives, and uh, so the Israeli Supreme Court declared or evaluated the Israeli conflict between Israel and Palestine, despite its being uh, with a non state actor, is an IAC, which you might be able to use in some way to criticize this analysis. Um, I mean, the Israeli Supreme Court reached this conclusion on two separate occasions. One, because the, um, there is an occupation in the West Bank and obviously an occupation situation is IAC. And then it had to kind of like say, you know, why the conflict, despite the fact it's between a non-state actor and a state um, is still an, uh, an IAC. And the, and the second time between Israel and Hamas in Gaza Strip. And then it kind of said, because it was cross-border, then it was like an IAC. I don't know if you want to use it as a, as a, like a, as a point of, of dispute or, or to, to kind of like uh, criticize it or I don't know somehow to, no, I to use. for sure yeah I don't know yeah um, just kind of you mentioned it um, and when you kind of like mentioned uh, the Boskovsky case I'm I'm not sure how much again it kind of goes to your presentation yesterday how much can we actually use those cases to support any kind of like hypothesis that they've raised because they're very anecdotal and even when it kind of like tried to to explain the level of organization it's very much only goes to the fact of the case and doesn't really give anything that is beyond that and kind of like give more of a rule of a thumb to how to to evaluate those uh criteria so maybe so i don't know if i have any point to say but just like <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's an early yes in terms of being able to use it that's but well, let me first when you the israeli case of course whenever you refer to something you can question like yes it's been mentioned but is it correct yeah the second part i definitely think it's not correct on the law or on what basically the general accepted is but the first an occupation is an ayah and how I read that is more the court saying that it's not that we are in an ayak with it, but 
the relation between the state of Israel and the individual members of the organization is governed by the law of Ayek, which is, of course, correct if you have an occupation, because the, the relation between the, the persons in an occupied territory and the occupier is governed by the law of Ayek, irrespective of whatever is going on. Um, but in if she wants to focus on Nayak, then I'm not sure if it no. observes <laughs> obscures. But in I well, I I, for, I don't agree with you on Boskovsky, but that's more that because if you look at initially indeed at the ICY, it was very um case contextual focused. Mm -hmm. But then in for example in Lima, purely related to Kosovo. But then um in Harajinai, they were like, all right, we've now had uh, seven or eight cases where we've we the, where the ICY has set stuff on these the, the different criteria to collect all that and make like a broader overview that generally for a non-international it was still a bit inward looking like looking only at the ICY but in Boskowski it was done, done a lot broader it looked at other it looked at national uh, domestic case law it looked at other um, other tribunals it looked at uh, the Inter-American Court it looked at so that was really meant to map kind of a broader thing. And it has been used since then for both in relation to the conflict in, uh, in the car, uh, in Sierra Leone, in um, uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, the discussion in Côte d'Ivoire. Um, so various states in um, uh, uh, used by the ICC, but also domestically. So, the, for example, the Netherlands, uh, the various uh, um, um, the, uh, chambers dealing with international crimes cases have taken these criteria and have used them, applied them in other situations. So I, I think that they may, because they were designed to be broader, they can very often use in a non-case specific way, but the issue is there, there were Come, they they still came up with it with very conventional warfare and then what you bring in for the organization now you have these kind of loose groups of um uh, like various armed groups that may come together or not how does that affect the organization criteria and then as you said the drones there is a big question of course is this still it, it worked definitely in the past mm -hmm. it may still generally work now but is it going to continue to work um so there, there, I think there's definitely a question there. And that's really where you, you started. And I was like, oh yeah, nah. and, and then you kind of left it to go back okay, to the, okay. um, to the uh, your conclusion in the end, which is still in itself also uh, an interesting um, thing, but you, you uh, to me at least prematurely left the, um, the discussion mm -hmm. on the, um, on really how the development of of warfare will affect the ability to to consider the, the structure. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, uh, just to wrap up the discussion on occupation and the question to what extent an occupation necessarily inter internationalizes the conflict. There is a very interesting case from the European Court of uh, Justice, not Human Rights, the, the EU Court. Uh, from 2021 on Western Sahara, and they had a oh, yeah. little paragraph on it, and it's just it's interesting because it's you know outside of the scope of the usual suspects being you know. What. So that's one. I'm not sure to what extent it's helpful, but it's definitely worth checking out, and it's often overlooked. Um, and the second question is, it's a tiny one, and I don't know whether it's uh, it was a deliberate choice or so it just you know happened. But I was a little bit puzzled why you rely on the old commentary. Uh, on ah. No, actually, Three, I... right? was the conscious choice. There is something in the new commentary from of 2020 you don't like, and I'm just checking your paper for footnotes, and I see you reference it once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And other than something. this, you rely on the one from 1960. <laughs> now, I... It's more substantial. Yeah. 1960, no, no. No, but it's... <laughs> no, it was a matter yeah, of the, going back to the first on top. First That's commentary. <laughs> I made it on purpose to refer to the first commentary, but then again, it's a draft, and I may also check the differences in mm -hmm. between different commentaries. All right. Just, uh, sorry, just to follow up this, uh, the whole commentary mm -hmm. thing, because you were saying like reliance of sources and like which one is more, again, reliable, whatever. The 1960s are what most courts would rely upon and the 19, and the 2016, for example, less so, and there's a lot of like issues regarding the way that the ICRC interpret uh, the, the commentaries now, I think there's a lot of states that kind of like, uh, 
uh, but I do think it's it's helpful just to you can give like a framework with a critical yeah. right? Mm -hmm. to, but, you know, if whoever is going to review this paper during the peer review is going to ask you the same question, like make sure it's somewhere and you know more this it's, it's more visible in book notes. Well, it, I'm it relates yeah, to I, I agree. the chronology, of course, but then in both cases, it, it now imputing views of 2016 into what Common Article 3 was thought to be at the time would make it even more mm -hmm. kind of maybe obscure, mm -hmm. but uh, the reason why courts and stuff are generally not referring to it, and that like, relates to chronology, you can't refer to a source that's newer than the facts in question, and the majority of the cases that are before any courts predate 2016. Um, because the commentary, it was, it takes into account those kind of facts. But that's there. I'm, I'm sure that soon we will see more and more references to the new commentary. For sure. No, I do think that they would, but I think that they would do that still with caution because I do think that the Pictet commentary is still considered to be more. It's just because of the name. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, maybe I'm very Israel centric, you know, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I have a few comments. Um, Okay, the firstly is about the Tablada case. Um, it is not made for the Inter-American Court. Mm -hmm. it, it was made for commission, the okay. American Commission. And it was, a, I don't know, a argumentation in the Article 50. There is a before step to pass to the court. So I the, the binding effect is different for us, for instance, here yeah. in an in inter American law. Uh, and for for us, it is very mm, anti technical. It was more uh, um, Claudio Grossman's intention to remove the IHL inside of the inter American jurisprudence. So, yeah, it is very questionable. Uh, yeah, we, we use the the, the Boskowski criteria in in fact in Colombia, for instance, to um, begin or start the military operation. We have to assess the Boskowski criteria about the violence intensity and rate of organization because um, we have a lot of uh, non-state armed groups. Some are uh, criminality and some are guerrillas or um, paramilitary. So it depends on that mm -hmm. both criteria. Uh, um, another another comment, uh, yeah, commentary is about the coalitions in the Latin American situation. It is very difficult topic because we have uh, a lot of cartels. Drugs and um, they are they have uh, a high level of uh, intensity of, of violence, but the rate of organization is very questionable because yeah it is um, criminality so so it's difficult to uh, apply the use of force or, or lethal force. In this case, um, we have a doubt about the the that criteria in the in, in the in the Rwanda cases because, in fact, as you said, in the same appeal chamber, but the context is very different and the weapons were different in in both cases, so. Yeah, when when you use the Boskowski criteria, you think about the sophisticated weapons. In fact, could be uh, regular weapons. For instance, in the far case, uh, we have a uh, irregular weapons, but uh, they are sophisticated weapons, uh, like. Uh, uh, handmade bazooka or 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 landmine productions. In fact, we 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 have uh, an, an an structure or not 
we know. <laughs> they, 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 they had an instruction uh, by the Irish Republican Army um, uh, in, in Colombian case. So they, they uh, had uh, a, a great uh, a knowledge about the explosives, um, that kind of, of weapons. Um, yeah, I agree. It, it is, uh, they are uh, rational actors. Uh, in fact, uh, besides, uh, they are uh, uh, irregular actors. They have um, strategies and military operations. In fact, my presentation <laughs> has a, 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 a irregular military operation, but they accomplish the IHL. So, so it's important to understand the, the rationalization of the war by the non state. Um, and, and, you know, for, for your research. Uh, it is a, a, a big question for Colombian context because uh, ICRC said uh, a few months, uh, we have a uh, six armed conflict, non-international armed conflict because we have a confrontation between state and non-state armed groups and non-state armed groups uh, <laughs> have a confrontation, uh, but for instance, for the special jurisdiction for peace, it's a it's a big question if we have a just one armed conflict or not international armed conflict or six non international armed conflict because I know depends on that answer uh, we can assess the. Uh, intensive threshold, for instance. So, yeah. Uh, and no more, <laughs> uh, maybe maybe the, 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 the last commentary, um, maybe regarding uh, your paper about the uh, organization criteria, is the new criminality or new non-state armed groups uh, have uh, no hierarchical structure, maybe hybrid. You no, know? uh, one part is a hierarchical structure, but in the base or has uh, I don't know uh, red structure like a criminal organization or something like that. So the question is about what is the standard in that cases, and if you have to use the different kind of force, you no, know, the lethal or no lethal force it depends on the part of the structure or, or all organization is part of the armed conflict. It is a, um, no. Thank you. Another observation, something that I had written down and also and in mind, I, I will send it to you anyway. I made comments in the, oh, in the PDF, but there are these annoying little comment things that you have to press on. And then yeah, they, you know, <laughs> so that's why I couldn't use it now because I was, but, um, but uh, the, the way how like the, the criteria, like the um, intensity organization, etc., has been looked at is always with the idea like it. You need to have, if you have two armed groups, of course, both of them need, both need to fulfill it, but a state doesn't have to fulfill the organization criteria. And it's also really not the state that can decide on the intensity because then the state mm -hmm. could just start bombing its citizen, its civilians. And by that way, create a, a situation whereby it would be allowed mm -hmm. to start doing that. Um, Noam Lubel has been in like one of the articles that he, he uses the phrase in his book actually also is it like you need two to tango mm. so it's really about kind of both sides and that's something i think especially towards the end of your paper you need to be um, mindful of that whether or not you want to put the reliance on the state side oh, okay okay or and then the two that the discussion in Ju june 2012 Ju july june 2012 in relation to syria when um, for the first time afterwards, the ICRC at least, not 
uh, intentionally but openly declared that it was uh, considering it organized enough um the 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 fsa free syrian army for there to now be a situation of armed conflict while well, states had already for months been saying like oh this is a civil war but not really in a legal way but uh but the, the icrc was kind of holding back on that because we're like well for now it's just the government bombing its citizens we don't we don't want to call this an armed conflict um so this yeah the, the to, to tango kind of idea, like make sure that you you take you keep looking at both sides in the, for the discussion of the argument. Can I another thing? So I think you do mention the fact like AP two, and I wonder how much you want to rely on it because again, as you mentioned, the threshold is really high for establishing a NAC under this, like you need to have, like one of the parties had to have control over a territory. And, and I think for the sake of, of your debate, you don't want to be there, right? Like you want to conceptualize more options mm -hmm. than, yeah. than that. So maybe- Yeah, I also think it will be part that. of the this rewriting of the first part mm -hmm. as Olivia said uh, before. Mm -hmm. like, I will put your suggestion with his suggestions and revise the structure of this first part. Because they could really like put you in a very specific mindset of a conflict that, mm -hmm. that you envision yeah, exactly. very differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like an opposite point of, of the whole government decide when it initiated an armed conflict is with the, um, I forgot the name of this case, it was also in the European Court uh, of Human Rights, um, regarding the targeting of suspected um, terrorists in Gibraltar. Uh, the UK, mm -hmm. Yeah, where the UK said that it was not in an armed mm -hmm. conflict and it was, but still used. So it's like a two-edged sword kind of uh, argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a British history to say they are never in armed conflict. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, 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 and and it's part of the, the whether <laughs> or not we want to rely on what state believes it's mm -hmm. in to uh, to determine this threshold. So, a stream of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, it's it's really helpful to have a stream of thoughts, and I will uh, like it, it's cool for thought for me, so I can revise, recheck everything, and make sense of what I wrote. Because uh, yeah, rereading it, I was like, "What did they do?" <laughs> but yeah, definitely, it needs some more, um, a more precise direction. So we we'll definitely make use of your uh, your suggestions. Back and over. Oh, I don't mind. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think you got a very. Uh, Elaborate and organized response from Ophir. Uh, it's going to help you, you know, organize and then follow the feedback.